What if you're wrong? In uh, 2006, this book appeared, written by a scientist, Richard Dawkins. He was a well-known scientist. I, I, I knew of him, but I didn't know he was an atheist until that book came out. That same year, he was giving an, an address in uh, Virginia, and uh, he took questions from the audience, and a woman asked him, what if you're wrong? And he, he responded that anyone can be wrong. If you're a Christian, you know what it's like not to believe in the gods of other religions. He told the woman if she had been born in India, she would have been a Hindu. If she had been born in ancient Greece, she would have believed in Zeus. And he finished off by saying, what if you're wrong about the great juju at the bottom of the sea? Which, I don't know if he made that up on the spot, but I've never heard of, uh, of that in particular. I think that his answer was correct, but it could have gone further. The woman, I think, was basically echoing what is called Pascal's wager. Pascal was a mathematician, physicist, and inventor, philosopher, and Catholic theologian. And he wrote a probabilistic argument for believing in God, kind of like a, a, a cost-benefit kind of analysis. The idea is that if a person chooses not to believe in God and they're right, what do they gain? Well, they gain maybe their Sunday mornings where they don't have to go to religious services. They gain a little bit of money where they don't have to donate that to the church. But they don't gain a whole lot. Now, if a person chooses not to believe in God and they're wrong, they suffer eternal torment and hell. So the idea was, I believe, that Pascal would have said, the risks outweigh the benefit so you should believe in God. Well, as I mentioned in uh, this clip and in this clip, it's not so simple. Uh, Pascal was analyzing a binary choice, believe or not believe. He was in France, Catholic country at the time, and he probably saw it as a, as a binary choice. Either you believe in Catholicism or you don't. But it's not that simple. As I mentioned in, in those two clips, Christian denominations do not all accept each other. I, I also brought that up recently in another clip. The idea being, well, first of all, there are 200 denominations in the United States, Christian denominations. But secondly, the word denomination, although not inappropriate, is meant to hide something, I believe. You see, denomination has a meaning of an autonomous, autonomous branch of the Christian church, fine. But think about what it suggests. Denomination is also used to talk about money. And the idea of denomination with money is all of these mon all of these bills are legal tender. They're all valid money. But the situation is not that way in uh, Christianity. As I've gone into in the past, um, Catholicism used to say outside the church there was no salvation. They meant the Catholic Church. I've heard that some Baptists say that Catholics and Mormons are in need of salvation. They're not saved. I heard a radio preacher once say that if you weren't baptized by immersion, you're going to hell. So the point is that Professor Dawkins could have brought that up in response to the woman's question. And I think that would have shaken her faith more. Okay, even if you, for the sake of argument, accept the fact that Jesus exists, his churches disagree with each other. If there's 200 denominations, what are the odds that you're in the right one that's going to get you to heaven? And I think that's a much more uh, harsh response, but, a, but also a true response. Bertram Russell, was a, he, he has been called one of the great intellectuals of the last century. And he was a philosopher, a logician, a mathematician, historian, social critic, political activist, etc. Won the Nobel Prize. And he was asked once, what would you do if you found yourself standing before Yahweh and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And his answer was, not enough evidence, God. Not enough evidence. And I, I want to come back to that, but I want to kind of take a little detour. And I'm going to re relate a little story from my uh, high school days. There was an urban myth going around when I was in high school. And of course, when I was in high school, uh, sports cars were very desirable. Most of the guys my age wished they could afford one. And 
The story was this, that you could get a very expensive sports car for, let's say, $100, whatever, a very small sum. But the reason you could do that was because a couple had died in that car and they hadn't been found, let's say, for six months or a year. And so the discussion among my friends was, would you buy the car? And some, some of my friends said, no, absolutely not. No, 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 even if it was free, they wouldn't take it. And others said, sure, I'll buy it, and I'll have the interior stripped, and I'll have the upholstery redone, and I'll have a wonderful sports car. One more story, a story from India. In India, feet apparently are... If, if you touch someone with your feet, it, it's, a, it's a huge insult. I once saw a TV documentary about the film industry in India, and they showed a clip where a man is in a, probably a temple, but he's in a room, and two men enter the room who obviously mean him no good. They are tough guys, and they're coming towards him. So he takes off his shoes, he holds the soles of his shoes towards the men, and he runs towards them, and they flee. Apparently... If they had been touched by the shoes of this man, that would have, I don't know, dishonored them or his family. At any rate, so the point is, in India, a feet, you have to be careful where you point your feet. So the story is that a man went into a temple and he sat with his feet pointing towards the altar. And a person came up to him, the man, and said, you are pointing your feet towards God. That's disrespectful. You shouldn't be doing that. And the man said, fine please point my feet in a direction where God is not. What are the point of these two stories? Well, I think these two, the two stories I just mentioned, there's something called the inkblot test. These stories, I think, tell us that some people are more heart-centered, emotional, and that, for instance, they would never buy that car because they know that people have died. And others are more maybe mind-centered and more analytical. And I'll buy the car, I'll just have the inside stripped and redone, and I'm, I'm fine. And so, getting back to Bertrand Russell, when he says to God, not enough evidence, I think that an emotional, heart-centered person would feel he was being impertinent, disrespectful. He's implying that God failed. God didn't provide him enough evidence. And they might be outraged at his answer. But I think a more mind-centered individual would just think about it and say, it's true. In Christianity alone, 200 denominations saying that if you pick me, you're saved, but if you pick one of them, not all of them, but, but some of them, you're not saved. Not enough evidence. Which one should I pick? If I wanted to go back to Catholicism, because that's religion of my birth, but if the Baptists are true, I'm not saved, if, if what they say is true. Or I wasn't baptized by immersion, too bad. So I think there's a dichotomy between heart-centered people who often accept, I think, eternal, uh, external authority. I think they're more inclined to accept it as dogma, as dogma. And they meet God perhaps in ritual and in hymns. That's an emotional thing, singing songs. I think they're given to a petitionary prayer. And perhaps in their, in their profession, they tend to be helping people. They're, they're heart-centered, and they, they're good people. And, and maybe they become a nurse or a teacher or a social worker. I know a woman once who was a social worker, and it was heartbreaking the work she did, helping uh, abuse children, and she did not make much money. I thought she should have made two or three times what she made. But she would, kind of was like a self-sacrifice. Mind-centered people. I think they often accept the authority of their own mind above external authorities. And they meet God in thought. Maybe they consider thermon, sermons that they hear and in services. Maybe they uh, read theology. And, I th and often, perhaps, their profession involves a search for truth. They're researchers, they're professors, they're scientists, maybe they're philosophers. Th just a thought. I'm not sure how, how often this holds, but I think it probably holds sometimes. And I want to point out that for mind-centered people, and I think I rank myself in that class. The search for truth is a form of worship. What I do here for me, even though I find a lot to criticize in religion, 
I feel this is a religious activity because it's a search for truth. I don't say I find truth all the time. I might make a lot of mistakes, but I'm trying to find truth. And I just want to close. I've mentioned a few people, uh, Bertram Russell, Richard Dawkins, Pascal. Uh, I want to close with uh, another guy, Einstein. Our famous scientist developed the theory of relativity uh, equals mc squared, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm just going to show you a few things he had to say on this topic and then end. So, it seems to me that the idea of a personal God is an anthropomorphic concept which you cannot take seriously. I guess I feel the same way. My views in Ernest Spinoza's admiration for the beauty of and belief in the logical simplicity of the order and harmony of the universe, which we can grasp only imperfectly, but trying to grasp the truth. He said the divine reveals itself in the physical world. Uh, we have the ultimate ground of existence, being God, being the divine, being the physical world in some sense. Lastly, Einstein said, a deeply religious non-believer. I could not have said that better myself. And is what I'm developing here a new kind of religion? Well, that remains to be seen. But to answer the opening question, what if I'm wrong? I would say to God, I tried my best. There are some things I just couldn't believe. And I tried to follow the truth as best I could. And that was all I could do. Thank you.